Hello, puppies and kittens. Welcome to Skep Talk. It is November 27th, and I am accompanied by Matt Dillahuddy. Some of you that know me may may be aware of him. How nope. you do, Matt? I'm all right. I see you. You've already got the snakes out. Um, I'm probably not going to go dueling snakes tonight because Wednesday night we're doing an episode of The Hang Up, and it's Arden's birthday, and so it's going to be the two of us, and we already said we're going to end up showing off snakes so okay gonna be a, a birthday yeah. extravaganza but who knows there might be other yeah. snakes that show up tonight yeah this is one of my favorites this is my this is my reticulated python yarman gunder and yeah, sometimes he's brown like today sometimes he's green i don't know how he changes colors but it's lovely when it happens all right so <laughs> Uh, upcoming shows, I understand, tomorrow, Tuesday, the 28th, Dying Out Loud with David Warnock and Shannon Q. Uh, Matt, what's the Wednesday show? Is that is that uh, uh, that's the, the hang-up? Up. Okay, that's you and Arden. And then Thursday, the 30th, we have Katie and Arden, and that one is Transatlantic. Is, is that right? Yes. Okay. All right, and that's the, the only information for the upcoming shows that I have so far. All right. And uh, do we have anybody uh, screening calls? Do we have any calls? Oh, are you not in Colin's studio? I'll take care of calls no, if I'm... you want. Yep, please do. All right. Uh, yeah, we got calls already. By the way, um, I haven't. I, I may have done Skep Talk once. I, I don't remember. It's generally not my thing because what we like to do is make sure that there are people here who are legit experts in the field. And so Aaron is, <laughs> as someone with an actual degree in biology and tons of experience uh, in debating creationists. Generally, I don't tend to debate creationists, although it's been offered a couple of times. If you're someone with creationist views, uh, by all means, pick up the phone and call in, and I'm sure Aaron will correct you while I sit here and smile as, as if I knew what the hell I was talking about. Uh, but anything else, if you have questions about skepticism, uh, you have some wild uh, woo-woo beliefs, uh, get them in. But we've got uh, Dan already on the line from Texas, uh, who's an atheist who wants to talk about the evolutionary advantage of faith in a godless universe. So, Dan, you're on with Aaron and Matt. Uh, hey, guys. W what an honor. Uh, first of all, Aaron and Matt, uh, it's just such a privilege to be here with you all. Thanks for taking the call. Thank you much. Thanks. Thanks for calling. Uh, so, uh, I mean, basically the, the point I was, I was making here is that I know a lot of the times when you guys are debating, uh, especially when, especially Aaron, when you're debating creationists, uh, they always get hung up on the topic of faith, of course, because they do. And uh, I think the reason for that is because that the process, the neurological processes that lead us to faith are evolutionarily advantageous to us uh, because they allow us to see something like it, I know that one might say uh, you mistake faith for trust, right? I, I get that argument and I don't disagree in a lot of instances, but I guess the example I would use, and it could be a flawed analogy if it is, I apologize, but let's say you're on top of a burning building, the building next to you is not burning. And there's like an eight foot gap between the building, but you're like, you know, 20 stories up, right? And you know that you're not exactly athletic, but that death is behind you. And that if you're running, trying to make that jump, and you're scared you're not going to make it, you're evolutionarily, you're physically aligned more for failure than if you somehow can trick yourself to find the calming ability to say, no, I've got faith in myself. I know there's things at risk, and I can make it, right? And you know you're tricking yourself. You know you're fooling yourself to be able to align your body, to calm yourself, to silence the dissonance in your brain from seeing something that you're pretty sure you can't really freaking do. Uh, but yet you've got to do it to try, even though you know you probably won't succeed. But if you can trick yourself into thinking you have a chance of succeeding by believing in yourself or whatever, you have an advantageous ability to get across that gap. Uh, again, it's tricking yourself, and it's not something that should be taken as some system of belief in what's real. Uh, and, and religion hijacks that ability, that calming the dissonance ability to then say, well, you feel the effects of, of following our lines of bullshit. So, uh, you know, that's proof right there. That's, that's your physical evidence, if you will. Yeah. I, I often say that, that faith is not synonymous with trust, that it takes both a suffix and a prefix to turn trust into faith in that, uh, 
faith is a complete trust that is not based on evidence. So when you're when you're running the probabilities and and the evidence ahead, and you realize that hey, if I don't make this chasm, if I don't jump from this building to this building, I'm just going to die, and my chances are slim, but I've got a chance, and it's possible, and this is what I'm going to try to do, and I'm going to I'm going to run as fast as I can and see if I can make it because I don't have a choice. That's not faith. Yeah. Faith is faith is very often believing, making believe something, or convincing yourself of something that is not true or not evidently true, and being determined to believe that it's true anyway. No, I, I completely yeah. agree on that point. For sure. Well, uh, yeah, because I, 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 that's thing, exactly you were. That's what I was going to say. You're you're trying to make a case for faith, but you haven't described faith. Basically, you've said I oh. have reasonably assessed my chances, and if I stay here, I'm going to die. And while I don't know for sure uh, if I can make it, I know that if I pump myself up, I at least have a better chance of making it. That's not faith. That's that's that is a a, a rational expectation based on actual evidence of what your chances are. Um, I yeah. I don't have or need faith in anything. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I again do see your point, and for, I think it's just the definition style. I mean, the the first definition, of course, uh, I, I, I should pull it up, I suppose. Uh, but my point being, of course, that, like I said, it's probably a flawed analogy, is just that there are purposes where having not just trust, but being able to set aside, you know, it's kind of like when you watch a movie and you kind of set aside, you know, you, you suspend your disbelief, right? Because you want to be in the moment with the movie to kind of understand what the character's going through, even though it's a fantasy hobbit walking through, you know, Star Wars or whatever. Uh, but in a similar way, it's like being able to set aside, you know, like to be able to silence dissonance, to set aside, you know, rational logic and even rational fear, to be able to give yourself that calming advantage, to silence the dissonance in your brain, to be able to better focus on the tasks at hand, right? I mean knowing perhaps that maybe some other factor could come into play that you can't necessarily see to begin with. And I'm not talking supernatural at all, mind you. Uh, just that, you know, there's, we know there's always factors that just could happen, stance by coincidence, that allow us to push through where we wouldn't succeed, you know. Um, I, I wouldn't yeah, say I that everybody, every faith believer necessarily holds to the description that I'm about to give, but I have, I mean, I, I really wouldn't say that. I mean, it would, some people have sincere reasons for believing what they do, but I have had confessions from a number of people, including just this last weekend. One of the one of the people on my show basically confessed that he believes in creationism, not for any evidence, but because he wants to. Because he said right. that believe that believing that that God created everything out of nothing just just so that he could be the most important being in the universe and he'll live forever. He says that's awesome, and so because that's awesome, he's going to believe it. A handful of people have told right. me that, uh, why would I want to believe what you believe? I'd much rather believe this other thing. So they're making it out like it's a choice. You just believe, right. and by believe, we mean make believe. You're just going to convince yourself that this thing is true. Uh, I've had people tell me that, right. that they know, on, on rare occasions, I've had people tell me that they know that what they believe is not true, but they're going to believe it anyway. And uh, there's a gamut of, of that kind of thing. There's people who say that if it's not true, then... then uh, so, then I don't want to know it. If if loving God is wrong, I don't want to be right. That kind of thing. <laughs> sure. Well, and of course, we're limited to what we can even know anyway, no matter who we are, because we have limited hard drive space upstairs, you know, in the gray matter. So, you know, everything is all based on that anyway. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, we're, and I, I mean, I don't mean reality. I just mean our understanding of reality. So, uh, yeah. you know, I, I just but mean I mean, that, you know, I could see where they're, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought there was a gap there. Um, when I watch a movie and suspend disbelief, I'm not suspending disbelief. I'm just saying, okay, I'm not going to actually call bullshit on this. I'm just going to go with this here, and it's temporary. That has absolutely nothing to do with exercising anything at all like faith in my daily life. I can watch. Uh, I stop watching shows. When the shows violate their own rules, I'm happy to watch tons and tons of sci-fi. And as long as the world is internally coherent, I not only don't have to suspend disbelief, um, I don't even have to consider whether I believe it or not, because it's a fucking fantasy world. 
So when I'm watching Star Trek, there's no belief suspending because it's a fantasy, just like anything else. So I, I don't understand. I don't understand why bringing up suspending disbelief at a movie has anything to do with whether or not we would benefit from using faith in our, our daily lives. Well, again, I had meant more as a, a tool belt in our survival, uh, you know, toolbox rather than a hey, what's, thing what's to the do tool? in our daily lives. Give me, give me a scenario where where faith is actually a tool that I can benefit from. Uh, when you feel based on your own interpretation of the worldview perspectives you have of the universe, right? When you feel that there's something you feel the need to do, even though nothing else is compelling you to do it, and, and you see impossible odds, but you, ha you, know, you, you feel that it is the right thing to do, and you have at least logical enough reasons to think that it's worth pursuing, even if it is, you know, everyone else says it's stupid, but they have no reason to say it's stupid. Uh, you know, being able to set aside, you know, the... I mean, hell, in some ways, like, uh, perhaps some believers may need to have faith that, you know, uh, atheists, who they see as some type of, you know, religion of its own, which obviously it's not, you know, th that maybe they know something that all of the people in their own particular lives who they've seen as elders or, or venerable people don't. You know what I'm saying? Which, of course, if they're... No, religious, I don't know what you're saying, don't. because I asked for an example of when faith would actually benefit me. You gave a completely nonspecific, no example, and nothing that showed where I would actually benefit from faith. So, no, I don't know what you're talking about. I, I, I apologize if I, I gave a different flood example. Um, again, I, I just go back way, to the idea. What Matt is asking for is give us an instance where convincing yourself of something that is not evidently true would be of benefit. Which, yeah. Plus, actually, in that case, that's doxastic volunteerism, which I don't think is possible. So we already have another problem there, but I just want to know, give me a scenario where faith is actually going to benefit me. Hmm. Um, I, I mean, I, I suppose in, in one way, it would just come down to faith itself, which of course, you know, is still evidence-based. So, uh, I mean, I certainly see your point. Again, I was just simply- Wait, did you just say it comes down, did you just say it comes down to faith itself, which is evidence-based? <laughs> Because because no, faith no, no, isn't no, no. evidence based. Because believing in yourself, I mean, what you what you know to be evident, evidently true of yourself from what you have. I don't. Do. I, I don't, don't know what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> Every time you try to clarify what you're talking about, nothing gets clearer. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, I apologize. I'm just fishing for. Uh, I'm trying to better answer your question. I'm really, I really am. Uh, and 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 uh, I would love for that to happen, guys. I'd like to understand, but every time I ask for something, I we're not getting anywhere yet. So I, I mean, I, su I, I suppose the whole point I was simply trying to make, uh, and 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 this is not necessarily just trying to give an example, but I'm trying to explain what the example would show, and it's just that I'm trying to say that perhaps. The, the concept of faith is just the ability to trick oneself for a purpose, right? To, to, to knowingly trick oneself, to be able to accept, to, to silence the dissonance, to accept something for a moment to accomplish a thing or whatever. Again, I'm simply saying that religions hijack a natural process. I'm not, I'm not justifying religious faith at all. I think it is a aberration of what seems could be a neurological normal process for survival. And maybe I'm just getting hung up on terms. I'm really not trying to be pedantic. I apologize. Okay. No, no, no. It's, I, all I wanted to do was understand, but, it, it, you know, and I, and I think I understand what you're saying, except that the, the type of faith that we would find in religion isn't what you're talking about, and yet you right. want, yet you want to hold that this is religion hijacking it. So how is it, how they hijack it if it, it's not if that's not what's going on well what i mean is when you're able to trick yourself through what, what i'm talking about like uh being able to like suspend you know logic for a moment to to try and do something or see something from a different perspective or whatever uh is different than 
religion trying to say, oh, silence the distance by saying, we have the answers. You don't need to worry about things or think about things. Like, yeah, yeah I'm just saying I, that, like, I still don't, I still don't get it because what you're describing isn't faith. Not, not to me. Yeah, I apologize again. I, my purpose was not to be. You don't have to apologize. I'm just trying no. to. I, uh, okay. No, I, I just wanted to say, uh, you know, thanks again for, for talking to me. Uh, I, I value both of you guys' work. Uh, y'all, y'all make the world a better place. You're, you're helping to, you know, shine light in dark places. So, uh, you know, always big support for me. Um, if you, Matt, you come uh, up with a better way, here. if you come up with a better way to explain what you're talking about or another example or whatever, I'm happy to, you know, call back and talk about it, but, but you were going to add sure, something. Absolutely. Sorry. Well, I, I was just going to say, I've actually, I've, I've written R in a couple of times. I hope I'm not bothering him. And, and Matt, I actually wrote you recently, but it's not about uh philosophy or believer. It's, it's actually about board games. So, um, <laughs> but anyway. Uh, I just wanted to thank you all again, and uh, hopefully I'll be able to come up with a better um, better clarity uh, of what I'm trying to say. But I, I need to do some neurological like study research into what scientists have found there anyway to try and try and those. So uh, basically, just that you know, like people like faith is a natural dissonance calming ability, but it's tricking yourself and. Religion uses that to say, well, look, it calms the dissonance in your brain, so it must be real. They're using no, a natural no point, fooling yourself process for validation at no of point, falsehood. At no point did my Christianity ever seem to me or to anyone around me as me tricking myself, nor was it ever presented that way, nor does it make right. sense that way. Well, absolutely, you can't say absolutely. that religion's co-opting, tricking yourself, if at no point it's like it's not like that. Well, what I mean is they're they're, they're co-opting the the dissonance calming effect of being able to trick yourself by using that process to validate their lies. Prove it. Uh, Prove it. And again, I, I, prove it. I, again, I'll just need to do some more research. Prove uh, it. But you know. I'd right. love to, and so I, I will do research. But thanks again. There you go. Thank you very much, Dan. Well, I thanks see that we have, have a. a great time. Thank you. Yep. I, I see we do have a theist lined up. Yep. Who wants to argue that, uh, it, that it's more likely that there is a God than not? We want to take that one. Yep. Yep. I'm ready. Martin right. in Georgia, you're on uh, Skep Talk with Matt and Arn. Awesome. I nice to meet you guys. Um, so I guess if I can just get started, I don't really know how this works. I've only watched a couple of it. Um, I was going to just mention, I guess, that uh, I, my primary argument would be from both like the, the, our, our inability to understand the, um, probability of there being absolutely nothing in the universe as well as uh from a moral why we have like, moral impetus to certain things you, you you broke up for a minute we couldn't hear the end of that oh uh and i i said uh from our inability to understand absolute nothingness as well as the fact that we have a moral impetus to, you know, reject murder and race and things like that. Okay, let me let me let me jump in if if yeah. I can for just a moment. First of all, uh, there's a number of seemingly a growing number of cosmogonists, at least the ones that I've that have had the privilege of talking to and reading from, uh, are convinced that there was never a time when there was absolutely nothing, never that the universe is in some sense eternal. Even if there was in models of uh, cosmogony that include a singularity, that singularity uh, is itself something. Uh, there, was, uh, there was never a time when there was no singularity. The singularity itself may be may have had a past uh, in, in like an hourglass kind of a formation uh, of the universe where it's a big bang, big crunch kind of scenario. It's a, it's a different type of oscillation nowadays than what that was. But, but in general... The, the consensus is material energy cannot be created or destroyed. A universal wave function continues. 
the universe is eternal, uh, changes states or changes shape, form from time to time, but it, it always existed. There was never nothing. In a universe in which there is no God, but there are animals such as we, there would have to be, in any social creature, there would, there would have to be an understanding among animals that you realize that you, if you're picking a fight, you just might get killed. That's the, the simplest thing. Live and let live would be a, a simple requirement that, that predators only hunt what they think they can take, take down and they don't want to risk anything because they, they don't have a medical plan. You, uh, you, you, hold, you saw me holding this, uh, this reticulated python a little bit ago. I have so many snakes that, that could cause damage to me. They could, you know, but they don't. They're comfortable with me. There's no need to do that. I, I have animals all around me, and all of them exhibit a, a type of morality. There's a type of compassion. They, they can tell your feelings to a degree that we can certainly tell theirs. And this is in a universe in which there is no God. That this would have to be the case. There's no way around it. If there's a universe that has animals at all, they're going to have to understand this. I, I find that fair. Um, I would say one one counter, uh, like to the, the first argument you know, from the cosmological perspective, would be I, I just put it on a probabilistic uh, basis. Simply. Even if we had an eternal, uh, I guess, universe coming from at this point what we understand to be a singularity, I kind of like the the the, the how we attribute time, I guess, in our human mind to our observation of entropy and how things moving uh, you know, into a more or a less ordered state gives us a perception of time. I would I would think it's more probabilistic than not that those things can do so based off something putting those things in order rather than being you know I I I thought of this or um, I've heard of this idea of of if the universe itself is eternal in nature and we can like, we can accept that uh, we can think of it as points on like, on graph or on a paper and at a point these points can interact with each other and cause you know the expansion that we see that has occurred in the universe based off this decrease in the entropy or sorry increase in the entropy of our universe so if we do see that we would have to say that something or there has to be some sort of entity that 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 permits these eternal things to interact with each other and like some force has to be behind that okay so then um, what would a what would a god be and and how could it have anything to do with that so i i think a god could be just that force just anything that would allow for whether the universe is eternal or not anything that would allow for the individual, we can just call it, you know, singularities or this one singularity to do something, anything that, a, any force that gives it the opportunity, if it is eternal in itself, to do something other than just be eternal. How would whatever a God is allow something to be? Would that mean to not interfere with it and just let it be? No, I think it requires an interference. Otherwise, whatever so, so eternal nothing state can happen unless was. So it's not that the God is allowing it; it's that the God is making it happen. Nothing can happen yes. because of natural properties. It it can only happen because the God is pushing it. If that is yes, so in a way, yes, like. It only so how if, how would this God? And we still haven't defined what a God is, but how would this god do anything by so i guess that as to me i think of it as i and even though this is i think one of those ways we can like as humans get our our small minds like we have no scope of what actually you know 
occurs to allow what we see in the universe. But if, if just the fact that something is being allowed to do something means that there are prior limitations, and I think just the setting of boundaries itself requires something well, let, outside of know. the thing itself. Yeah. No. Let's, Let's start Permitting with that, something yeah. does not mean that there are prior limitations. Permitting something means that you are uh, uh, you are intentionally not adding limitations. It doesn't tell you whether there's any prior limitations or not. Yeah, and can we? Meanwhile, can we set another point meanwhile, we sorry. still I still don't know what the hell God is or how it permits anything or why it's required to permit anything. You seem to be presenting a problem. Yeah, you seem to be presenting a problem that I don't see as a problem so that you can solve it with something that I don't see as a solution. Yeah. So would you say so there that in is another thing no that we problem. have to look at? Okay. Another thing we have to look at when we talk about a God is, you know, what kind of God and the a, a favorite atheist argument is, well, will, which God, but let's, let's cut to the chase on something. Uh, regardless whether a God exists or not, the Bible, the Quran, the Book of Mormon, the Bhagavad Gita, all every scripture of every religion is man-made mythology. None of them would be true. None of them. Do you understand that? Well, I would have that's where I was trying to go into more of a probabilistic likelihood. Um of if like I think if we establish that it is more like I think we could also establish which religion is more like true? Well, How are you okay, calculating probabilities know. for something that you can't, you haven't defined, you don't know anything about, and you seem to be calculating probabilities from it? I'd love to see the math on that. Yeah. So we just want to cool. be clear, just to start with, we know that Adam and Eve didn't happen. They're, they're not real. The Exodus evidently never happened either. Tower of Babel is a different is a different story. That literally didn't happen. The, we know for certain that the global flood did not happen, that all of these stories in, in Genesis and Exodus and Job, you know, God doesn't keep, God doesn't store snowballs in storage bins to be brought out at, in, in battle situations. I mean, none of this stuff is real. The earth is not flat, despite what the Bible says over and over again. So we know that the Bible is false, even if God exists. You understand that? So is the Bible a scientific document? I would say no. I think okay, so it, you, you I, I, I look the, at it as more as You accept historical. the onset. The Bible is false, and now you're going to argue for a God anyway. I, I right? think there's truth in it. I, I, can we agree that there's well, there also was an truth Ethiopia. in it while being false? Just like, yeah, there, uh, like There was like, a river called Euphrates, but very little else. Well, um, I, I think the, the, there's historical truth about it, but like, even if we were to, we could make the same, I think, um, equivalency with like Newton's principle. Do you, do you understand if, that Adam and Eve were not real? False. Do you understand that so Adam and Eve Adam were and not Eve, real I think, in any sense? So, so Adam and Eve were not real in any sense. Sure, but I think okay. the concept of man being a um man being some sort or having some sort of relationship with with whatever higher power is, that we're referring to that if they did have that kind of relationship um okay. and there was well, a the reason i brought that up from that relationship we could we could associate that with being you know the first people to sin Okay, well, we we can argue about who. we can we can argue about why we don't have a relationship with God later. I just wanted to specify that under no circumstances can if, if you could prove that a God exists, it would not save the Bible. The Bible's done. The Bible's false. Doesn't matter. You could disprove evolution. The Bible. You could dis disprove evolution tomorrow. The Bible was already disproved yesterday, and there's no bringing it back. So do you have an argument for God that has nothing to do with the Bible? Well, yeah, that's where I was beginning with. I, I didn't try to incorporate the Bible into my original claim about the universe morality. 
but um, I, I, I would say, I would say, would I think we could agree, right? That like uh, we more likely than not as human beings, like for example, evolved from like Australopithecus to say, but we do not. You say based on the evidences that we have, it's more probable than not. We don't have, we don't have the specific intermediary organisms that led us to human beings. But well, we, we, can we say actually that have an awful lot of that. The genomics, I mean, we have a good, we have a good large amount. But, but yeah. I would say and Anthropus it, platyops, it, for it, example. But that that wasn't the point I was trying to make. I mean, we don't whether there was a god or not. Okay, first of all, it doesn't change evolution. It doesn't. It doesn't have any effect on evolution. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't require that the universe start from nothing. It, uh, it, it does not save the Bible or the Quran or any of the other sacred scriptures. All of that is just that, you know, fantasy, folklore, myths, and legends. That's it. God doesn't require morality. Why would it? Well, you have to well think that's where I was trying to establish this. You know, no try, try not to think in, in terms of... In, in all of the galaxy, we've got just this one, one planet and this one solar system and this one outward, uh, outward arm of this, of this one galaxy and, and, and in just this one 500-mile diameter circle out in the desert somewhere, we've got all these stories happening and, and that only occur in this brief period of time. And you're going to base your God on that. If the God was real, it would be bigger than that circle. It wouldn't be a God of Middle Eastern Jews. It wouldn't be a god of Arabs. It would be a god well, to be of fair, everywhere. I don't, I don't, to be fair, Arn, I've never heard Martin say anything at all about advocating for the biblical god. I, I know, I know. So what I'm saying is if, if, if it was a god that created the universe, it wouldn't be the god of the Jews. It wouldn't be the god but of we Arabs. Don't know, you don't know if he's advocating for that god. I know that. I'm, I'm trying to say oh. outside of that. So if we're, if we're going to talk about God being concerned about morality, but this is this is one God that governs over all of these all of these worlds, all of these galaxies. He's, he's, it's not going to be a requirement that there's any kind of punishment, any kind of damnation, any kind of thing that's associated with that. Typically, in most folklore, for how we treat each other, that God could be completely apathetic. I okay, yeah. Is it okay? Um, I, I would say to that point, um, I, I think I think there, and I and I've heard you argue against this, and um, as well as Matt, but um, that I I don't see how you can object to there being like this non-subjective morality. Um, and and I know certain claims about objective morality I, I disagree with, but but I think at in, on, on certain um, certain levels of human beings, we do have this sense that there is some sort of moral truth in like just in the fabric of it's entirely our, societal. I I would I I think I would disagree, and I think most. People, okay, then show, the me, the, show me the evidence. You said I was rejecting something. You, you, you said I was, I was rejecting something objective. So show me the objective thing, because I already described early on why, why in a universe without a God, we would have to have morality. All animals, and particularly all social animals, would have to have a morality in order to exist. And you're telling me I'm ignoring something. What am I ignoring? Well, I don't think all organisms and all animals do have morality. I think it's only specific human. Social animals. Why doesn't your dog kill and eat you? Well, I, I don't think the dog finds value in killing. And I wouldn't, but okay. I would say that's not the same thing. How do you humans. know you're I right? We don't. How, how do you know you're right? You, you, no, 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 no. Stop. Stop. You, you don't. When. Arn brings up something about how other social animals have mores, ethics, behaviors. O other great apes, we have observed them objecting to things not being fair. All of those things are a moral sense of some point. The fact that you don't 
think your dog has a moral sense is not an argument or evidence. It's not even in any way explaining why your dog acts as if it understands the difference between right and wrong, as dogs do. Your dog knows when it's been a bad boy and when it's been a good boy. To, to just assert that you don't believe it, okay, cool, you don't believe it. Um, you didn't explain anything. You didn't provide any evidence for anything. You didn't find any way to knock anything down. And still, we, we skipped past a bunch of stuff to even allow this to continue because you talked about a God being that thing which serves as a grounding for whatever, whatever you're going to talk about, and then you just assume that it's something that you can or should or would have a relationship with. Even if such a thing existed, even if there existed some foundational thing that serves as a grounding for logic or morality or the, or the foundations of morality, that doesn't mean that you would ever have any relationship with it. You are taking um, speculation, multiplying it many times over, and then injecting all of the shit that has nothing to do with it. If there's a foundation for reality, prove that it's a thinking agent. Prove that it cares about a relationship with us. You don't get to assume any of that stuff, just like you don't get to assume that because you don't think your dog knows about morality, that all of a sudden it doesn't know the difference between a good dog and a bad dog. Well, that's, that's very fair. Now, as far as would, people having I, a relationship with God, there's a whole lot of people who think they have a relationship with God. George Harrison of the Beatles famously said that he had a personal relationship with Lord Krishna. Not only did he, that, that he could pray to him and believe that Lord Krishna was hearing him, but that he could see Lord Krishna and hear him, that they had two-way conversations. This is George Harrison and, and Lord Krishna having two-way conversations in the same room where he can see each other. There's a guy that lives a, a mile down the street from me who he worships Bast, the cat-headed goddess, because she showed up in his house and met him. She appeared in his house, physically manifest, and bade him to become her disciple, which, of course, he did, because she went through the trouble of showing up. And it's like this, this woman was... was uh, canvassing for her campaign, a political campaign. She shows up on my doorstep and meets me, introduces me, tells me about her platform and everything that I voted for. Much the same thing when a God shows up in your house and you get to physically meet that God. Okay, that's interesting. Especially when it's kind of hard to, to, to fake what she is because she has the head of a cat. That's kind of convincing. pretty funny so martin can we can we narrow down so that we're not bouncing around between 20 different potential god arguments or statements um to what god because you you called in to say that it's more likely that there's a god than not you haven't told us anything at all about how anyone could possibly calculate any of this stuff um, and, and we haven't, we haven't defined a God. We haven't shown any sort of demonstration of calculation of probability, just kind of a guesstimate about probability. And then, I mean, it doesn't matter what anybody pushes back on. I still don't know what God you think is probable or why, which is a, a difficult place to be in when we're, when that's the subject we're supposed to be talking about. Right. So I, I guess I will I can try to get into to this, um, and and I would say um, I, I guess I think one of the things that I would ask you guys, to see your opinion on it, I would say like, I, could we agree maybe that there is likely a fifty fifty chance that there would be either no. absolute nothing or absolute something, like just in a general like if you were to flip a coin to say no. Something, no, something would be there. Well, no, I, no, no, I'm not going to agree when I ask you how you've calculated the likelihood of things. I'm not going to agree that there's a 50 50 shot of nothing or something. The fact that there are we two options, something. the fact that there are two options saying, doesn't mean the that the, uh, the, I'm still fucking talking. The fact that there are two options does not mean that the odds of either option is 50%.
So what's your case that it's 50-50? I, I would, would I you would agree that, that there's a 50-50 chance that, that between Matt and I, that, that one of us is from Earth and the other one is a Martian? Well, but I think that comes with a presupposition that, like, you have parents, that you, you, you've existed, you've, you know, we never observed life on Mars. Like, we always have those, like, preconceived understandings. And so why but would, would you bring up At nothing? that level, on, on that level of, of being, I think, just the universe, I think yeah. we would say, like, our only understanding would be that, that there's either supposed to be nothing or something. And I would say that those are the only two options. And I, I think okay. given let's, let's those imagine are the only... I can accept. There's either there's either nothing or there's something. Uh, there's right. something. So there's okay. there's so, so there's not nothing. Yes. Chance of Has something. Has there ever been one? nothing? Has there Chance ever been nothing? nothing? Is, there anything, is there anything that you can point to any time where there's ever been a nothing? How do you know nothing is even an option? Well, I I would say. Uh, based on our understanding of of the universe, I would say like every every I, I would say the same thing about quarks and electrons and their states. I would say that they like we Martin. we are we observe in universe that is just two opposing entities in general. No, you know, no, in, Martin, in the, Martin. The fact that you can point to other examples where there are two opposing em entities does not mean that nothing is possible. The question was, do you have any way to demonstrate that nothing has ever been at any point in time in any way at all? How do you know that nothing no, I, is, how do you know that nothing is an option? You don't get to point to quarks and say, well, it has a counterpart. I, so evidently everything must have a counterpart. That is that is a fallacy do you have some way to show that nothing is and should be considered an option and i i think the interesting answer to this question is i don't and i think the fact that i don't gives us you know it's more likely than not that there that that either you know we have something that's eternal in nature that nothing has never existed so therefore we right. had we, we all agree there was I, never I, a time when there was nothing the universe was not created therefore we didn't need a creator so there is no creator so that's part of god gone right there you haven't defined what a god is other than you know we, we have to assume maybe you were talking about a creator because you said it was determined by whether there was nothing but we there was no nothing so that part of your argument is gone. We have morality, whether there's a God or not. So that part of your argument is gone. It's more likely than not that you have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, what, what's just happened here is that you've blathered on about possibilities that you can't demonstrate or won't demonstrate. And when I point out what the problems are, now when you admit that you don't have any way to demonstrate that nothing should be considered an option, you're your response was to say you find that very interesting that because the fact that you don't have an answer to that question, therefore, means it's more likely that something is eternal, and therefore, that eternal thing is God. You, the plural of anecdote isn't so. data, and what you are doing is multiplying your fallacies to reach the conclusion you fucking want. Not no, the one no, that's no. There. I, I, I didn't say that because there's something at all in like in our existence that there is only God. because I mean, Aaron interrupted you. Okay, only because Aaron interrupted you. You said the fact that you didn't have an, an, an any way to demonstrate that nothing was an option made it more likely than not that something is eternal, which is false. It's absolutely false. Whether or not you can demonstrate that there is, that nothing is possible doesn't tell you at all about whether or not something eternal is more likely or not. That is absolutely a logically flawed argument. So you, you went with, oh man, I can't answer Matt's question, but that makes my proposition even more likely, which is absolutely flawed reasoning, start to finish. 
Is there anything that you can demonstrate? And do you have any objectively verifiable evidence to support that would lead us to your thing that you called in about that a God is more probable than not? If if you are saying, I, to understand you correctly, um, if my understanding is correct, you're saying that there is, uh, the fact that we have existence, the fact that there is something, doesn't have anything to do with the probability that there could be nothing. And even though we have something, that something does not need to be determined. Am I understanding no, that correctly? No, 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 Martin, okay. you're not understanding because you didn't fucking listen. I didn't say anything about what the probabilities are. I asked you questions about what you could demonstrate. And when you admitted that you couldn't demonstrate them, you then tried to extrapolate that into something else. I didn't make any statements about what is possible or probable. What I did was point out your logical fallacies. And the fact that you then try to sit here and say, let me see if I'm understanding you correctly. The only words that should have come out of your mouth is, let me see if I'm understanding you correctly. You're saying my arguments are fallacious because that's what I did. Yep. Okay. Another I, way to I, put I that is you don't have an argument. Probability. And you don't have anything did you to tell discuss the call probability screener. with. Hang on. Hang on. Did you tell the call screener that you want to argue that it's more likely there's a God than the not? Yes. Yes. I, I was, How do you, I was, in, I, I was listen, in talking in reference to what a I yes or no. That's a yes or that's a yes or no question. How on earth do you make a case yes. that something is more likely without talking about probability? Well, I was more so re responding to your rejection of why probability why, why i haven't demonstrated the probability how do you I, make I a case we, uh, that something is more likely than than not without talking about probability that was my question so okay i i, I will go back into that direction but i that's no, why i wanted to actually, answer like, my just question to establish something to answer my question at a meta level without caring about your argument at all how do you talk about how do you make a demonstration that X is more likely than not without talking about probability. More likely is the colloquial for probability. You're saying X is more probable than not. X is more likely than not. And then you want to say, well, I didn't call in to talk about probability. Oh, no, I, I think I do not wish that. No, 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 that, that was not what I was trying to say. I apologize. I... I was more so only referring to I, I was I was talking just to establish um, how to reach you know the probability that I was referring to. and I wait and did I you just say probability after saying like, you didn't call in to talk about probability? Oh no, I absolutely called in to talk about probability. Oh my fucking god! <laughs> I sorry. I, <laughs> let me wait, can I clarify myself? Just give me like. No, seconds. you can, but, you you can, but you're now only talking to Aaron because I'm playing chess. <laughs> okay. No, I don't think you okay. can. So, uh, Matt asked you a handful of clear yes or no questions that had you answered them with a yes or no, that would have clarified your position. You couldn't answer oh, any no, no, no. yes or no again. question with a yes or no. That. No. What was the yes or no question, please? No. <laughs> I'm not redoing all the fucking work because you couldn't pay attention and then listen to the question that you were asked. I sit here patiently <laughs> listening to you for a long fucking time. It is not, I don't, ha why should, why should myself and all the listeners, matter of fact, we're going to hang up. And if you want to know what the question is, you can go back and rewatch the show. And then when you figure out what the questions are, you can call back sometime. But I'm not rehashing Sorry, the I entire the last answer. 30 minutes the of the Shut up. Shut up. <laughs> I'm not rehashing the entire last 30 minutes of this show just because you can't be bothered to pay attention to the show you called into. Yeah. So, I mean, I night, sincerely Martin. apologize. I thought I did answer the question. I just wanted to say, like, no, yes, you didn't. Like, yeah, I, no, I, I thought, believe I did. You thought you I did answered, say if yes. You thought I you answered in for the problems. question. If you thought you answered the question, don't ever fucking call me again because you are too stupid for me to engage with.
or too dishonest. One of the two. You're either a liar I, or you're too stupid. Which one is it? Because we just established I believe I'm that you wanted us to ask, I, ask I genuinely again. do not know. I don't care where I met where I messed up. I know you don't, and yet I, you I, think I, you're sitting I, here I saying you think, think you do. So, whichever the answer is, the option. I'm done with you. Yeah, you are a waste okay. of my fucking time and my audience's time. Yep. So, if there are any other theists frustrated with this performance and think you can do better. Call in. Be happy to talk to you. Let's see if you have a better argument. In the meantime, oh. I can see that we do have somebody in there that wants to say that, that wants to ask me a question. Uh, if uh, if I don't believe in the Gospels, then what do I expect theists to provide as evidence? Okay, so can we take that call? We can. Hello. Hey. Hello, Joe. You're on. You're oh, on Skip you're Talk. How you do? Good. I'm a theist, and uh, I don't want to blindside you. Basically, I disagree with everything you say. I've been watching your videos for a long time now, and uh, you're wrong. I have to tell you right out up in front. Uh, you're wrong about every single thing. Your understanding of the Bible and science, also. Cool. You want okay. to pick one thing? Because so, I don't think we can yeah. correct all of it in one show. So, I mean, you want to start with one yeah. thing? Yeah. Okay. Now, as far as, can we go yeah, to your question? Apostles. Yeah. Can we go to your question first? Do you want to read yeah. that question? Uh, the 12 apostles. The 12 but, but apostles. Your question in the doesn't upper have room to do with 12 Jesus. apostles. Well, you want it, evidence you, of a God. When we provide it, you say, well, I don't the, believe the it. Question, you I'm say asking you to read. I don't believe it. You I'm don't believe in miracles. And, uh, you can't read it. So okay. hang on, Joe. You, you, you told the call screener that you had a question, which is if Aaron doesn't believe in the Gospels, yes. what does he want Theus to provide as evidence? That's your question, which okay. we're both yeah. happy to answer. Okay, so if we were talking to, let's say I'm not talking to a Christian. Let's say I'm talking to a Muslim or a Hindu. Now, mm -hmm. the Muslim is going to bring the Quran, and he's just going to quote the Quran. That's his evidence of God. Are you going to accept his citation of the Quran? No. Ah, okay. And why would that be? If, if you're talking to a Hindu and they want to cite because, the Bhagavad Gita he, about what Lord Krishna said, they, when, when Lord Krishna said in the Bhagavad Gita that he created the entire multiverse and that he's the source of all the gods, are you going to believe the Hindu based on that, that citation? No. Why? Because the apostles' testimony is better. We have eyewitness testimony. Except you don't. Not only do yeah, you not you have, have eyewitness testimony, but, but the fact that you think the apostles' testimony is better doesn't mean it's better. You'd have to show that it's better. Yeah, and the Quran also claims to be eyewitness testimony. This is Muhammad taking direct dictation from Gabriel, who's working as God's secretary. And then with the Bhagavad Gita, you have King Arjuna, who is recounting everything that Lord Krishna told him directly. So firsthand eyewitness accounts. He saw the multi-armed form. So in both of those cases, you have eyewitness accounts, whereas for the Gospels, you don't have that. But you've just automatically rejected both of those other scriptures because the, the real reason is the claim is not evidence of itself. If you want to know if the Bhagavad well, Gita is correct, you have to find, you have to go outside of the Bhagavad Gita to say that. If you want to know whether the Bible is correct, you have to go outside of the Bible to show evidence to support it. If you want to know if the Quran is correct, go look at the things that the Quran says and go see if you can verify outside of the Quran that the Quran is right. Do you understand that? No. Because the Quran is so. the corruption of Judeo-Christian theology. And, he stole and everything. Muslims say, he stole everything. And Muslims say, Muslims say that the Bible is a corruption. That I'm not even uh -huh. kidding. The Muslims say that the Bible uh -huh. is a corruption of the true word of God, which had to be brought down in the Quran to clarify it from where it was corrupted in the well, Bible. So there's another reason Muhammad that we can't came. take the claim. We can't take the claim as evidence of itself. Muhammad came six centuries after, 
anyone who comes six centuries after and uh, who wasn't there at the time, uh, I put no credence in. Yeah, and Lord Krishna was here six centuries like before. Lord Krishna was huh? here six centuries before. Six centuries before well, Jesus. I've talked to, uh, I know many Indian people from India, I'd like to clarify that. They admit it's mostly faith. There's not too much eyewitness accounts in their, in there's their a, religion, there's a lot of if Christians. you've ever bothered to talk to them. Joe, Joe do, you a lot of do you have, admit that, yeah. Joe, do you have an huh? argument, do you have an argument supported by evidence where, for example, I'm wrong about something I believe? Well, I don't know too much about what you believe. Evolution has been disproven for a hundred, for so long. Uh, like Joe. I said, the second law oh. of thermo. Uh, what? Joe. Okay, go ahead. Are, are you just trolling? Because it seems yes. like you're just trolling, no. which is going to waste time. Because I, I'm sorry to tell you. Actually, I'm not sorry to tell you. Evolution has not been disproven. Who did? Have it? you, Who been, have you it? ever heard of when? Lewis Pasteur? Yeah, who was, and who was an evolutionist life himself. Only comes from life. Yeah, but that's abiogenesis, not evolution, and he was also disproving spontaneous generation, not abiogenesis. He also didn't prove Pasteur, that life only comes from Pasteur life. Pasteur was a Lamarckian evolution. The Pasteur no, was no. a Lamarckian Pasteur evolutionist. Pasteur showed that living things can only come from living things. The no, that's not of what he did. No, he did study was about. Make... No, he no. didn't. Huh? That's not possible. No, he didn't. Yeah, that's not what he did. The millions he, he of molecules required to make the simplest living thing simply couldn't have formed by chance. The law of don't know that. Yes, physics that's exactly you don't know that. Yeah, and you, if, you don't if, know Joe, what evolution just is. Keep, Joe, I, I want you to present an argument that's backed by observable evidence. I don't want you to just keep making assertions about the shit you don't believe or which Indians you've talked to and <laughs> what they believe. I want you to actually make an argument that's supported by evidence for something. Are you capable of you doing that? You also have to show everything he said is something we can prove wrong in a moment on Google. It only takes seconds to prove that this well, guy's wrong. You're, you don't so, believe, you don't I believe that. I in, uh, I told you, we had the, Joe, we Joe, had the eyewitness Joe, testimony. We Joe, can't you go don't, don't, you don't was, have any eyewitnesses. You, you have zero eyewitness testimonies. There, there is nothing in the Gospels that is verifiable as an, as an eyewitness. And even if there were eyewitnesses testimonies in the Gospels, you don't have any way to verify that they're accurate. And we know eyewitness testimony is unreliable. So you're basically saying you have something you don't have that even if you had it, it wouldn't be sufficient to the task. So I'm going to give you one last well, chance, Joe. I'm going to give you one last chance. No. I want you to show us that you can construct a valid and sound syllogism where the premises are objectively verifiable evidence that result in the conclusion that a God exists. I was talking to Aaron Ra. I was more interested I don't give in a him, shit. like I said. Here, I'm going to mute you, and you listen to me. I don't give a shit if you thought you were talking to Aaron or God or the Pope. I'm on this fucking show. I'm one of the people who helps run this network, and I just told you what you're going to do or you're going to get hung up on. So when I unmute you, do it, or I will have you fuck the fuck off. Go ahead, Joe. Oh, Joe decided to fuck off all on his own. Yeah. It, it, it was difficult for me to understand that you, you, you gave the option, are you, are you stupid or are you dishonest? It can very often be both. And in cases like this, I'm, I'm often given a quandary. Do I, do I even put up with another second with this guy? Is he, is he both too moronic to reason with and too dishonest to, to ever admit an error? Or what the hell is the problem? It's, it, it's frustrating. It's making the decision about whether they're trolling me or whether they're just dumb. I'm, I'm, it's, I'm it's meeting staggering and, examples. I'm meeting staggering it, examples of how dumb people can be. It's very difficult. It's, it's, it's almost impossible to tell. But this is why, so like the previous caller um, had some good understandings about stuff and it was a decent conversation. We, we went all over the place about nothing and morals and everything else. But when it got to, hey, I'm going to drill down to talk about 
are you able to demonstrate any of the things that you you're claiming it doesn't matter whether you have someone like our previous caller who had a decent understanding of the basics of you know philosophical arguments and stuff like that or joe who who if he's legit doesn't have a basic understanding of the facts of reality if you think that evolution was disproved you know a hundred years ago and yet on both cases, when you push to say, okay, here's your opportunity. We are live to almost 2,000 people right now. There's probably tens of thousands of people that are going to see this over the next few days. You have the best opportunity that you personally are likely to ever get to reach an audience and present an evidence-based argument for whatever it is that you believe. And every time we go down that route. We don't get an evidence-based argument. We barely get even a remote presentation of an argument. Instead, you get people like Joe, like, well, I don't want to blindside you because I want you to know ahead of time that I disagree with you about every single thing that you believe. Really? Because I believe that the uh, earth is an oblate spheroid and the sun orbits it. Do you disagree with that? You might because there's flat earthers. I believe that if I uh, take this notebook and hold it like this, and I let go, it's going to fall downward and hit the table. Oh, look, I was right. Did you disagree with that? It's the preposterousness of saying, oh, I disagree with you about everything. Okay. If you disagree with me about everything, then why did you call? Because if we can't agree with the foundations of how we're going to reason and how an argument should go, there's no way this will ever go well for anybody who's calling. But and it's the not, worst thing it's you not can that I'm do, always going to be right. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, I'm just saying the worst thing you can do is I get it. Skeptalk's not my show. I'm not on here most of the time. But uh, to to come in and tell me that basically I need to take a back seat while you talk to Aaron after I just asked you a question, uh, that's a pretty stupid thing to do. Yeah, I would love to be able to get, to get these people held to account when they say that they disagree with uh, both of us on everything. You have your examples. He gave a handful of examples that I can prove him wrong about in a second, but you'll never get there because they don't have accountability. That's the frustrating thing. You can't get any, you know, that Louis Pasteur disproved evolution. No, it, it, I mean, he has bizarre. no idea what he's talking about. He yeah. can't possibly disagree with both of us on everything because we don't agree on everything. We're not a fucking hive mind. Oh, I also <laughs> want to clarify for anybody that any 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 believers who might be watching that that don't know this, uh, spontaneous generation. Despite what you read in in uh, the the common dictionaries, because I've read Webster's dictionary and a couple of others, and there are a handful that conflate spontaneous generation with abiogenesis. The dictionary gets this wrong. Uh, every dictionary I've ever seen also gets the definition of animal wrong. There's a handful of things that the dictionaries just get wrong. The spontaneous generation was a supernatural belief that life force animates physical bodies and that when the physical body dies, the life force is like this evanescent thing that ebbs out, which is why dead, dead things smell bad. It's supposed to be a life force that's ebbing out, and the, and the life force also rots. And when your life force comes out of the body, or if it, it like in evanescence, it ebbs out and rots, that it spontaneously creates maggots, mold, mice, and, and other objectionable things like that. Why is it why is it disgusting forms of life? Because your life force is is rotting. That's why it's disgusting. It wasn't for the origin of all life on Earth. It was just this thing that George Stahl came up with because the guy stored things in jars with open open jars, and he discovered mice in one of his open food jars, and so he thought they magically appeared there. That's because this was 16-something, and it, 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 this was the 17th century, and even smart people were stupid back then sometimes. That's where that came from. That is not the same thing as when uh, as when Huxley and uh, and Rudolf Virchow come up with the idea that that life must have had a prior matrix, that the first cells must have come together from a prior matrix. An entirely different field. Well, we got a couple of atheists that have called in with questions um, about uh, fallacies and about kind of debate strategy things. So I guess we could take those real quick as a reminder. Sure. 
This is one of many shows on the line. Uh, today, you're lucky because Aaron's here. And so if you've got your creationism questions or your biology questions, this would be a really good time uh, to get in and do this. Also, you know, obviously we tend to have, you know, Guts of Given and, and Forrest on here as well. So there's a ton of people who know way more about biology than I will ever know. Uh, and so, yeah, I'll, on those, you don't have to tell me to sit back because you, you want to talk to Aaron. I just let you. But, but if I ask the question <laughs> and you try to shut me down, that's just you admitting that my question's a little too difficult for you. Um, but yeah. uh, tomorrow night on on the Hangup is uh, Dave Warnock's Dying Out Loud. Wednesday night will be myself and Arden doing a special birthday and reptile extravaganza on the Hangup. But we will also be taking calls from theists and transphobes and whoever else. And then Thursday will at 2 o'clock Central will be uh, Katie and Arden. Uh, Speaking of Arden, who just brought me some wonderful ice water. Thursday will be the Transatlantic Colon Show. And then next Sunday, um, assuming I'm not at a reptile convention, I think I'm going to be back for the Sunday show. But you ready for these next calls? Let's do well, it. To be fair, I'm pretty. I'm going to take the, this one because it's, it's clearly for me. So Jack has a question uh, about when I talk to Destiny about abortion. So... Hey, Jack, let's go ahead and ask your question, and we'll knock it out. Hello? Jack? Jack, are you there? All right. Well, I'm going to answer Jack's question, because Jack's question was, why would I focus on what was legal rather than what was moral? When it comes to the issue of abortion and the answer is very simple because i care about what the law is and what is legally permissible and i don't give a shit what somebody's moral opinion is about abortion they can think it's immoral all day there are people who think it's immoral but don't want to make it illegal in which case i'm happy to let them keep thinking it's immoral uh, because all i care about is what the law allows i'm not interested in sitting here having a debate about dueling foundations of morality um, it doesn't do any good. And so destiny, and by, and by the way, in that case, we're both pro-choice Dest destiny's entire thing was that he didn't feel that the bodily autonomy argument was a good strategy. Um, so the second oh. tenant on, of the, uh, the seven tenets of the satanic temple is that the struggle for justice is an ongoing and necessary pursuit that per that should prevail over laws and institutions. And what that means, of course, is that just because it's a law doesn't necessarily mean that it's moral or right. Sometimes laws should be overturned. Yeah, and we don't legislate merely on the basis of morality. There used to be a lot more moral moralizing in law. Like, for example, there are places where in the United States where we still have um, adultery uh, laws on the books, where it would be illegal for you to commit adultery. Uh, and that's entirely a, you know, a moral failing. It's not, but those laws are no longer enforced because we recognized or somebody recognized that uh, it doesn't really do us any good to try to merely legislate morality. There are laws that are based on our shared moral values, but only to the extent that our shared moral values clearly have an impact on the society that we're in. Um, something personal like saying, oh, it's immoral for you to like people with long hair, uh, or it's immoral for you to dye your beard purple or pink or, you know, and there are people who think things like that. Like literally, uh, I read a, a, an article today of a pastor. This is from Mohammed Meta's Friendly Atheist. If you're out there and you are not uh, subscribed to and checking out Friendly Atheist, what the hell's wrong with you? Because Hemet's one of the best of us and definitely <laughs> one of the best journalists out there or the secular movement at, as, at large. But there was a, an independent Baptist church that invited some people in to do a lecture on creationism. And one of those people uh, had hair that was a little too long. It was about maybe to hear. Uh, and it was, you know, a man with long hair. Um, and, you know, they weren't dressed fancy. This pastor was like, this pastor was falling all over himself to apologize for the fact that he allowed people to come in with some slides that maybe weren't, you know, as clean as he'd like. And they wore polo shirts and jeans into the house of the Lord instead of wearing their Sunday best. 
and they had long hair. So he's fallen all over himself to apologize for this stuff. I mean, this, this really happens. And, you know, if we were to legislate that, well, Aaron would have to shave his head and look like me and that, you know, I don't need an, an, a, a duplicate, but the, the deal here is that when I had that discussion with destiny, it was already pre-planned that destiny objects to bodily autonomy on a strategic level. This is why it was such an easy discussion. We sat there because we're in agreement about everything, but which one's the better strategy and destiny's wrong. We got two callers lined up. One of them seems to be a question for you. Yeah, let's let's go get back to that one and let's take the theist here. Oh, I like giving priority to the theist callers. So Alvin in Denmark's theist said wants to present arguments for the possibilities for a first cause. Hey, hey, Alvin. Hi, Matt. Um, and would hi, I, mean, I, I just have. I just, I just have one question before you get started. I'm, I'm sure Arn will have other questions as well. Sure. But let's say you were able to demonstrate that a first cause is possible. Would that do anything at all to help us understand whether or not there is a God that is the first cause? Well, that is possible. And also... If something is more uh, probable, then we should uh, believe that is the that 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 there's a god. Well, there, no, so, <laughs> yeah. If if we could ever get to, to showing that there was a possibility of a god, which would be very very different than the possibility of a first cause. But first, I have to ask the question: Is there a necessity of a first cause? Uh. But I, I mean, I think it's not necessary, but I think it's most logic. It's most logical, and uh, also in a universe yeah, that was never created, I think science has like cause and effect. So we should believe maybe there is a, a first cause, and well, just the like physicists we have a different the, physicists and especially what? cosmologists have a different concept of causality or causation than than regular people do uh there's so i've, I've listened to a handful of like uh well I, the names escape me but i've listened to a handful of physicists talk about that that causation doesn't even enter into their papers you know that that term doesn't come up so there's not a cause is often not relevant in cosmogony uh but i i'm just saying that um the world can end, it should end, uh, if time uh, lets it. And, and so, so there should be like, okay, what I'm trying to say is, there is a process of uh, things are getting old. So we, sh and um, I don't, yeah, it, it doesn't, I, I think, don't you think there's a first cause? No. Okay. Alvin, why not? Alvin, if if you were to demonstrate that something was possible, would that tell you whether or not it's probable? No, no. Uh, but okay. I mean, I can I Hang can on. give an example that is more probable. I, I didn't ask for what example. I, I, asked least, simple, I asked a simple yes or no question because I have additional questions. So. Demonstrating that something is possible doesn't tell you whether or not it's probable. Is it is it Correct. okay to is it okay to say that something is possible merely because you cannot show that it's impossible? Does it does a failure to demonstrate impossibility demonstrate possib possibility? Uh, just because that, uh, I, I mean. If it's impossible, then it's not possible. Sorry, I didn't no, no. get it. Maybe. All right, let me try this again because I, I don't want the language to get in the way. If someone yeah. cannot show you that X is impossible, does that mean that X is possible? Uh, 
uh, no. Okay, cool. I mean, so when you say you'd like yeah. to present an argument for the possibility of a first cause, you're not just going to show us that it's not impossible and you're not making a claim about probability. So let's just try this real quick. Give us one argument for the possibility of a first cause. Um, I mean, uh, just sorry, but I do believe that it's probable uh, that someone or something created the universe. I, I, I get it says here that you told the Scott call screener you would like to present arguments, plural, for the possibility for a first cause. I have now evaluated that we're not talking about probability and that an argument for the possibility of a first cause is not merely an, a, a, an argument that it's not impossible. And now I've asked you to present one argument for the possibility of a first cause. And instead of doing that, the very thing you wanted to do, you've decided to say that you think it's probable. I don't care if you think it's probable yet. I want you to present an argument for the possibility of a first cause, just like you said you were going okay. to. I'm giving you exactly what you I fucking can... asked for, and you are fucking it up. <laughs> okay, let, let me uh, give an uh, Try it again. Example. Let's try this um, again. Hey, everybody on Skeptalk. Alvin's here. Alvin's calling from Denmark. Um, and Alvin would like to present arguments for the possibility of a first cause. Instead of doing multiple arguments, Alvin, why don't you just go ahead and start and present your best argument for the possibility of a first cause? Thanks. My best argument, and this is not thought through well, but I would probably go with, uh, oh, this is, uh, I, I, okay, so what I believe in, is uh, 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 someone or something is either is either a creator or a material based on uh, the world because we only we either have a creator or uh, a material so we should believe that would be uh, the thing that has uh, created <laughs> Aaron is laughing that that has created I'm sorry uh, this is just so damn dumb it's not even anywhere near okay. the question Alvin um we're going to stop okay. L listen just listen to me you you're not going to get to say anything else but I don't want to have to mute you we're going to stop right here okay okay because you called in to say that you wanted to present arguments for the possibilities of a first cause it's clear right now that you either don't have or aren't ready or are too nervous or whatever. For whatever reason, you don't have even a single argument for the possibility of first cause. Because when asked to present it, you said, I do believe it's probable, not all. I would probably go with, okay, what I believe in is someone or something is either a creator or material based on the world because we either have a creator or material. So we should believe that the thing that has created there's not a cogent sentence in that entire thing. I, I typed it as, as you were saying it and got it as close to accurate as I can. There's no argument there. There's no evidence there. So we're going to let you go. Call back another time. Sit down. Work it out. Write down an argument for the possibility of first cause or whatever it is that you want to do. And call back. Call back to Skep Talk. Call back to Hang Up. Call back to Sunday Show. Whatever. All right. Now, I, I think it's funny that, that I often get uh, emails and comments in various uh, formats of people saying that they want to have an interaction with me, that they want to argue with me about this point or that point. And when I advertise that I'm going to be on this show and people know that I'm going to be on this show, where the hell are those people? You say you can prove me wrong in a minute. How many times do I hear that? I could prove you wrong in a minute. We got several minutes. Stack them up. I can prove, prove me wrong, wrong. Bunch of shit. I can prove you wrong in a second if I could just get God to show up and do it. 
<laughs> but he's not taking right. my calls. We have one more call. Or actually, we've got we got two callers now. But um, Mary in Florida, pronouns is she her, uh, has a question about a fallacy. So, hey, Mary, how you doing? Hey, I'm good. Um, hi, Aaron. Um, I mean, I have a master's degree in education and ed leadership and curriculum development, but I never learned in high school. Thank you. I never learned in high school about logical fallacies. So I've learned a lot from you, Matt, about those. But one clarification I need on one is um, the argument from authority. When yep. is that? When is it appropriate to state? Um, something from, you know, a uh, scientist like uh, Sean Carroll or Lawrence I, I know that Matt when is, is going to be is it better. not a fallacy? I know that Matt's going to be better prepared for this one, but it, what, we, what we often face as a fallacy is the argument from false authority, where you, you're, you're citing somebody who has a PhD, and maybe they do, but they're a geologist and they're talking about you know, uh, philosophy or whatever, or, or genetics or something like that. So there's the argument from false authority, but there's the other aspect of it where you, you say that this person holds this opinion and he has these degrees. And that means that he's correct because he is the authority in science. There literally is no authority. People with PhDs can be wrong. So yeah, what Arn's describing, there are two separate fallacies. But let me say this, citing the evidence is never a fallacy. Citing an authority to, to get to the evidence is never a fallacy. The appeal to authority fallacy is specifically when you basically are making the argument that something is true because an authority says it. I know yeah. this is true because Without Neil deGrasse Tyson says it. That is a fallacious appeal to authority. It, it's not a fallacy to say, hey, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson and, and you know these other people are pointing to this particular evidence. But if you say X is true because Neil says it, that's a fallacy. The other fallacy that Arn mentioned is the appeal to insufficient authority, which is nine out of 10 dentists think I'm the smartest person on the planet. <laughs> I also, it, I, I want to throw in also that because I don't, I don't deal with cosmology. I'm not a cosmologist. I'm not even particularly interest, interested in like the origins, if there are origins of the universe. Uh, somebody knocked on my door. I have three dogs. I know what you're talking about. Um, so if you cite the authority, and I know there is no hierarchy in science with scientists, but if you cite an authority without the evidence, then that's fallacious. It, the fallacy, uh, the appeal to authority fallacy is when someone says this is true because an authority said so. That's the fallacy. The second fallacy is appeal to insufficient authority which is when you cite authorities that don't have any expertise in the relevant area. So if you said, I know Pluto is not a planet because Neil deGrasse Tyson said so, that is a fallacious appeal to authority because Neil deGrasse Tyson could say anything and he might be correct or incorrect. Pluto's not, is, is no longer a planet, but not because Neil said so. And we don't know that because Neil said so. It, it, the fallacious appeal to authority is when you say something is true because an authority or an expert said so because authorities and experts can be wrong and that's why it's a fallacy okay if i could just tack on now that the dogs have finally shut up um because i don't deal in cosmogony it's it's not i don't know what the data is all i know is that there's a panel of people who are experts in this and they all hold this opinion for whatever reason that they hold this opinion more often than not these people hold this opinion that's the best i can do i'm, I'm going to suggest that hey maybe they know more than i do i'm not saying that it's right because they say so but be, the, the fact that they say so makes me inclined to think that that's probably more that i'm going to 
It's like, are you going to argue with your mechanic or your dentist over how they do jo their job? You know, you're going you're gonna to defer to the experts. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with deferring to the experts. There's nothing wrong with citing the experts. There's nothing wrong with citing the consensus. It's only a fallacy if the argument is structured in such a way that X is true because person P says so. Okay. It okay. doesn't matter whether they're an expert or not. Second, I had to talk to my second graders when Pluto was no longer considered a planet. I mean, they were like freaking out. You can blame it on Neil. And it, they, it's going to be a fallacy, but you can blame <laughs> it on Neil if you want. He's used to it. Well, well, I think it was a group of international scientists, but it's, it's a dwarf yeah. planet, really, is what finally i think they came up with but um would you like to hear an amusing um, backstory to that there's what a prompted that sure so this uh this not an exoplanet but this this dwarf planet that you're talking about uh that somebody discovered they didn't they, they had the opportunity to name it but they didn't name it uh a, the, the conventional way they didn't name it after a what is it a greek or roman god they right. named it after their favorite tv show so they they found this planet and they named it Xena. And it had a moon and they named the moon Gabrielle. Now Xena Warrior Princess was a popular show at the time. The scientific community, several ah. of them, got a little upset that somebody did. now now imagine Lucy Lawless, the girl who played the woman who played uh, Xena, right? She she, she's yeah, the only I, I person the who's show. ever portrayed that character. It, it wasn't an ancient myth. This was, it was only on this one TV show. She's the only person who ever presented it. So they basically named the planet after her, right? That's, that's pretty profound. But this started the ball rolling on people demanding that, why would you, why would you name it something <laughs> like that? <laughs> ah, shut up, dogs. <laughs> Sorry, people go in and out of the front door. <laughs> I get it. I have yappy dogs. Um, also, uh, did Texas pass that the Ten Commandments had to be put up in every classroom? Um, I don't remember what the result of that thing was. Okay. But not recently, if, as far if as I, I was, know. I'm re if I was teaching, I would not have put them up. Or I would have put buddha's eightfold path or the satanic temple well, seven tenants and really yeah, freak you, people not, out. <laughs> you'd have been fired and you would have had no legal recourse hmm really yeah hmm. okay well thank you guys um i'll let you go i know you prefer these callers but I love learning oh. about logical fallacies, and I've learned so much about that, as well as evolution from Aaron and uh, Mike Johnson. I love your videos, Aaron, on Mike Johnson. <laughs> oh, that guy scares me. <laughs> I know. But thank you for, thank you for that. Did, um, but from what a lot of legal scholars say, I do think Trump will go to prison. Yay. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. Have a good night. Good night. Yeah, for anybody who's still kind of confused, uh, if you said, I took my car to the mechanic, and the mechanic tells me that my transmission is shot, you're not making an argument. You're describing the process of what happened. And generally speaking, you, you, you're talking to an expert. And so there's a likely, a very strong likelihood that the expert is correct. There's a reason why we encourage people to get a second opinion for everything. Second opinion about your car, about your body, whatever else. It's because despite someone actually being an, an expert, they could be incorrect. They could be intentionally incorrect, trying to scam you, uh, which often happens frequently at mechanics places, or at least reportedly happens frequently, um, or they could just be mistaken. So if you were to say, 
it's true that my the transmission is shot and i know that this is true because my mechanic told me that would be a fallacious appeal to authority because whether or not your mechanic told you is independent of whether or not your transmission is shot what we need to be citing is the data and the evidence that that transmit or that they, the mechanics point to if you took it to see a couple different mechanics and several of them told you that it was shot it's not true that it's that it's shot merely because they said so it is more the case that the consensus agrees with the evidence which is what tells you whether or not your transmission is shot that's that's the way that works from a fallacy standpoint it's it is and we fall prey to it all the time which is why they put people in lab coats in commercials so that they have the gravitas of seeming to be an expert on something uh whether they are or not so it could be you know the nine out of ten dentists think that you know um tums peppermint and acid tastes the best well <laughs> being a dentist doesn't give you any expertise on that that is not the appeal to authority fallacy that is the insufficient authority fallacy um but meanwhile even if all even if nine out of ten dentists thought that crest was the best toothpaste that doesn't mean it is it's not true just because even nine out of ten dentists in, and at that point all we're saying is the consensus of those interviewed is that this is the best and that is true that this is their consensus whether or not crest is the best toothpaste is still subject to i don't know whatever we have one more question from one more caller and then we'll get on to super chats by the way this is one of many shows on the line and we do super chats and so we'll be reading all super chats over five dollars um you can get your questions in and you know Arnold will ask yeah, for five bucks you could probably get, have me go get a snake and we could probably duel with snakes during the um super chat portion but i want to make sure we get to our last caller today so Arn, you have adam in missouri pronouns are he him Hello, um, Aaron, Aaron Matt, and Matt. I love listening to your stuff. And my question is really between both of you, because you both have uh, your views on the laws of logic. And Aaron has said in the past that he doesn't have any pre presuppositions for the laws of logic, where Matt has stated that he views the laws of logic as presuppositions. Correct. So what's the question? So I, I think the question is your different views in between Matt's views of the them presuppositions and Aaron right. what is a, as they are not pre. Okay, what's the definition of a presupposition then? How do we know if something has been presupposed? A presupposition is something that you cannot or do not make any attempt to demonstrate, but you accept. Okay, so Matt sent me a book uh, by Hume, uh, which I, I found very interesting, and it, it included one uh, important quotable line, like a whole page, unfortunately, not a t-shirt kind of quote, but uh, where, if I remember correctly, Hume said that we have no choice but to make the same assumption that a baby or a beast would, that the data that we are getting from our senses is, is valid, that it's real. But and so if not, we don't have it what's that 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 has nothing to do with this right okay all right well if we're, if we're talking about a presupposition we're talking about the the then maybe i don't understand the question explain it to me he's asking well, whether or not the laws of logic are presuppositions not whether or not we are required to trust our senses or whether or not we're reasonable to trust our senses he's asking if the laws of logic themselves are presuppositions oh okay no then i was thinking along the wrong terms and maybe that would be because when people bring up the presuppositions it, it's always in context of how do you trust your own senses and particularly how can you trust your own thoughts how can you trust your own rationality if if, if my god is correct then how can you have a rationality that kind of argument You there, Adam? Yeah, I'm. I'm there. I was. 
I was just, uh, I didn't know if Matt was going to respond or because my, my was, because I've heard both Arn say that he doesn't view the laws of logic as presuppositions. And I know Matt has, and that's I remember, why I was wanting to get your guys. I remember one of the, I remember one of the conversations where this came up and we weren't, it, I was, I was talking with Eric Hovind uh, at the first reason rally when he brought this up, but he, but I remember that being, um, it, it wasn't about the laws of logic. It was whether we could, whether we could trust our senses. I mean, that's the only conversation I can remember where this, where it brought up whether these were presuppositions. No, it was at a different yeah. event. It was still Eric Hovind, but it was a different event where he brought that up, and it was that was still the context of it. How can, how do you know that what you're seeing is what you, is what's real or that sort of thing? Yeah, in this case, we're talking about the laws of logic being identity, non contradiction, excluded middle. I don't presuppose that they're true. I presuppose that they are inviolate, which means that there is nothing that would be accepted from them. We can demonstrate that they are true. We cannot demonstrate that they are universally true, that there's nothing that can violate that. Um, and I, I also have to think that you, you came to this conclusion, right? I mean, you had to, you, you thought about it. Are there, are there possible exceptions to this? Yes. And w w the, the issue here is whether or not there is a demonstrable grounding or foundation for identity, non-contradiction, excluded middle. And if you not only are unable to find one, well, if you're unable to find one and you still want to, to suggest that they are uh, true and always true, then that is, becomes a presupposition. Uh, it becomes a necessary presupposition because the laws of logic are a curious thing in that you're now reasoning about reasoning, which means in order to demonstrate that they were false, you would have to assume that they were true. And in order to demonstrate, and, and that puts you in a problem where you're like, oh, but that would lead to a contradiction, except that one of the laws is the law of non-contradiction. You don't get to say that there's a problem with contradictions until you demonstrate that non-contradiction is true. Okay. So we're stuck. Just like there's no solution to the problem of hard solipsism. I trust my senses. I live and operate in the world that I'm, that I'm experiencing, and I have to act as if it's true, because as soon as I start acting like it's not true, I'm almost certainly going to die. If I try to cross a busy freeway, um, and, and it doesn't matter if I reject the reality of the cars that are coming at me, I'm probably going to die. I can't prove that without actually doing it, you know, but there's, there's no way to demonstrate that. So I have basically two very simple presuppositions. One is that identity, non-contradiction, excluded middle are not only true, but inviolate. There's nothing that would, would be accepted from them. The other one is that whatever reality I experience um is either real or i have no way of demonstrating it's not real uh, and it would be almost certainly catastrophic to begin presuming it's not real so that gets into into the census thing that that arn was talking about but those that's really probably the only two foundational presuppositions that i make one is that i not only experience a reality but i'm going to presume that i share it with you because if not, then every caller who's asked the stupidest question and made me explain it five or six times only to deflect is, is like my own brain fucking with me. And I like myself too much to do that. Um, also, it would mean that I've written every wonderful song and every terrible song. Like I've written every Nickelback song and uh, every Peter Gabriel song. Um, that doesn't make any sense to me. And, and, and it's just arrogant to assume that I'm inventing all of this and if, if somebody else is inventing it and piping it into me and I'm a brand of that, then there's still at least somebody else. Um, that gets back to Descartes' cogito. But at the end of the day, I have to presuppose logic and I have to presuppose that I'm in a reality with other people. Maybe I'm not, but I don't know how you'd prove me wrong. I, I don't know how to prove, prove that wrong either. And... That's kind of just all I wanted to ask. Cool. And I want to thanks, Adam. Thank you guys for the conversation. Yeah, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. All right, we are uh, we are out of callers. We we have survived the call onslaught, and now we've got super chats. So if you haven't gotten them in yet, this is your opportunity to get in. I don't have the checklist, which means tonight, tonight, 
Not only do we need to thank Stephanie and a bunch of other moderators in chat, including Cookies, but also Amargan is the primary producer. And this is my first time let, letting a producer um, control the super chat things because normally if I'm on a show, Arden's producing. And so there's like a, a little super chat thing here where I can just click them all. But I have now given Amargan the lead in to pop up some super chats and we can go through them. Everything five bucks or better. Uh, you want to go first or second, Arn? Oh, here, this one's for you. I'll go, we'll first. go first. Yeah. So $10 from TaylorMade uh, says, uh, Aaron, what is your favorite species of venomous snake? My favorite is the Gaboon Viper. I know you own mildly venomous cobra, but do you think you will ever own any other venomous snakes? I have, I have mildly venomous false water cobra, which means that it is not an actual cobra. I have, uh, I had been toying with the idea of getting a copperhead, but uh, I've met opposition from others in the household <laughs> bringing in a copperhead. <laughs> the only time I've had a truly, in the, in the reptile community, in the herp community, um, there are hot snakes. And if you go to, can, to reptile expos, they will either allow hots or they won't. And normally when you're at one of the ones that allows hot snakes, they'll be in tubs that have red tape around them you mark them and basically a hot snake is one that is not just venomous but venomous in a way that is deadly or dangerous to humans um there are a number of uh venomous snakes that are relatively harmless to humans you might get a slight irritation like for example western hognose snakes which we have three or four of right now um they are rear fang venomous as are false water cobras aaron's got a false water cobra which is not a cobra at all as he mentioned but it's that's the way we name stuff sometimes like, Ooh, that's a false water cobra. And it's not a cobra. It's not even in the lap. Um, but it just, but it really the, looks like a cobra. <laughs> it, it does. And, and the hognose snakes do that thing too, where they mimic and, and flatten out as well. And there's a chance that I might be getting some, um, Madagascar giant blonde hognose snakes as well. And they'll do that. But so there are things that are venomous and rear fang venomous, like the hognose and false water cobra. If you got bit, you might get an irritation. But if you're a frog or a lizard or, or something like that, you're pretty much screwed. That's that's where their 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 venom is is dangerous. And rear fang venoms, um, so like if you're used to gaboon, gaboon vipers and other um uh normally hot snakes that have fangs that are like little hypodermic needles, so they'll inject and then they squeeze a venom sac and it pumps venom down through the, the inside of a hollow fang into you. That's the way most of the hot snakes will work. For rear fang venomous snakes, like the hognose and false water cobra, they're not like a syringe. They're like a grooved uh, tooth. And so they have to bite and kind of chew and they'll still pump a little venom out, but it basically drips down a groove. So it's if it, from an evolutionary standpoint, the question then becomes, is that a groove that is waiting a few million years to become a syringe like fang or is it a former syringe like fang that has opened up to become a groove and does it matter whether it's at the front of the mouth or the back of the mouth i snake stuff's just too awesome i don't plan to hold it hold to to keep any hot snakes i have had a rattlesnake in my garage um for a very brief period of time but I rescued it from one person's garage and let it go out on a ranch. Yeah, there is, there is an elapid that I quite like. Uh, there's two that look virtually identical. There's the, uh, there's the Malayan blue coral is my favorite. It's just mm. totally gorgeous. Red tail, red head, blue body, uh, a, a yeah. midnight blue body with a, with a neon blue stripe. It's got both a neurotoxin and a cytotoxin so that, uh, it, the neurotoxin will cause your heart to shut down, but it might take until tomorrow to die. Whereas the cytotoxin means that you're going to be on the, on the ground convulsing with all over body wide spasms until your heart shuts down. And that's relatively quickly. So quick and extremely painful or long and not that painful is your choice, but I wouldn't bring e either one of them. That, that, that would be my favorite venomous snake. Cause it's so pretty. And they're also it's gorgeous. They're, or they're also calm. I've seen pictures of people holding these in their bare naked hands. I would not advise that. I would not do that. I agree. <laughs> but holy <laughs> shit. They're gorgeous. Yep. All right. So thanks, Tony. Oh, wait. 
this is this is the follow-up one i don't understand why aren't and matt are obsessed with bragging about the size of the snakes we love them for their minds do we do we talk much <laughs> about the size of the snakes um i i got a bunch of little small snakes although i do have two black tail kribos um which are just about arn's retic will always uh be able to outpace in length uh any snake that i'm likely to keep Ten dollars from Taylor Made. Aaron, do you own any rainbow boas? Yes, I do. Also, Matt, do you only sell your snakes at conventions, or do you will you sell your snakes online? My gosh, Taylor Made, I feel like I should be tipping you for all this work you're doing advertising this. As a matter of fact, we not only sell at uh, reptile conventions, but we also sell online at Morph Market um there are only two snakes listed on our morph market account right now um that's just because i haven't had time to put the rest of them up but if you go to morph market and look in the uh seller list or epic loot exotics uh you will find our page and there are currently two ball pythons up there listed where there's a banana that is 50 percent het pied and 50 percent het lavender so it's chance of being had dreamsicle and there's a super gravel super pastel inchy lemon back there's about 55 more snakes that will be going up there very quickly um but yeah we we are now as of this week um we've got our shipping supplies and everything else i'm just going to cut and paste a link right there in chat to morph market so you know if you want one of those two snakes that's fine if there are other snakes that you don't see listed up there you can always contact us through that and if we've got them and I just haven't listed them yet. We're happy to do that. This is awesome. I get to advertise. Where is $10 the next from reptile yes convention? Me. The next one is this weekend in Leander. Okay. We may be vending. We're, we're on the wait list. We will be there either way um, because I might be picking up those, those blonde hog noses. We'll find out. Do you, are you scheduled for another reptile convention somewhere to vend? We're, Yes, we, we're we're definitely going to vend at NARBC in April, um, and we are also going to be at one of the Lone Star Reptiles, uh, uh, the next one in shirts, which I think is also in April. I'm on a wait list for like four others. Okay. All right, so $10 from Jungle, two of my favorite hosts. Y'all rock, and here's some money <laughs> for both of you. Out of all the animals you have, what's your most preferred and why? Great show, and thanks for the great content. Thumbs up. Matt, you answer that first. So also to kind of answer the other question, we had a Brazilian rainbow bow, but we don't currently. Um, and I got cookies asked if we ship snakes in the mail. Yes, you. there's a number of things like shipyourreptiles.com and uh, Redline. Basically, they make use of FedEx to overnight ship to a hub. It is all dependent on the temperature, both the from the shipping location and the receiving location. And so you can put heat packs in there. Some of them, we are approaching a point where we're not going to be able uh, to ship. There'll probably be a month or so where it'll be too cold either where we are or where we might be shipping to, to actually be able to ship that. So the question here was, out of all the animals you have, what's your most preferred and why? Um, I think my favorite right now is the male Woma Python. Uh, it was on my dream list of snakes for a long time. So were blacktail Kribos, and we just got those, and I, I really like them. But the, this is an exceptionally chill Woma, uh, really pretty. Uh, it's something I wanted for a long time. So For me, I have to have three categories. I love the parrot that I got from Matt a decade or so ago. I, I, I do. I love that bird. Uh, and he, he demands that I share whatever I'm eating. I have to share it with him. So that's funny. I, I, I love my loudest dog, even though he's so damned annoying to try to do a podcast because he will <laughs> go off. Uh, as far as, as for the snakes, uh, again, it, it, it's, it's a tough call. I have my, my, reticulated, my reticulated python, who is an absolute puppy dog. Despite them having this this terrible reputation thus far th that I've had him, he's been sweet, adorable, wonderful. I have a false water cobra female that I raised, and she's uh, 56 inches long now, and she's going to be about 8 feet. 
when she's full grown. And, and if, if she were ever bite, it would be a medically significant bite. But she's uh, she's a peach. She's not very cage defensive. I can take her out and I will take her to pubs with me. We go in literal pub crawls. So I, I love having her out. I'm not going to do too much of this. I'll answer whatever questions you have. But as a reminder, Arden and I are definitely going to be doing some stuff uh, related to snakes and everything else on the Hang Up on Wednesday. So $5 on the Raven 200. He, him, Arn, I love the Joseph Smith versus Joseph Smith series you and Bryce did. Uh, you're awesome, Matt. You're gay, homie. Uh, Jimmy, go <laughs> take a curb stop from Seth Rollins. Good. $5 from Monkey at Typewriter. <laughs> Aaron, this is for laughing at Alvin's nonsense because, brother, I was laughing just as hard at that moment. Great to see two thirds of the Trinity. Is that you, gay homie? Is that what that is? Yeah, YGH is your gay homie. Okay. Yeah. Oh, shit. Oh, and I almost popped my. Fuck. <laughs> I, hate, I hate the cable on my headset or my, my earbuds. Uh, that's and it a, just dragged across my arm. Yeah, this is the Woma that I was talking about. So my earbuds um, have a short wire on it, and I just dragged it. If you can see there, that little white thing on the back of my arm yep. is a glucose yep. monitor that monitors my blood sugar, and it almost ripped it off. And now I can't hear out of one of my headphones. But this is Paul. He is a Woma python, which is native to Australia. We have uh, him and uh, his girlfriend, who is Chani. Uh, she will bite you. She will bite everybody. She loves to bite everybody. But Paul is ridiculously chill. And a Woma is a snake that I wanted since I first heard about him. Uh, and even when we were in Australia, when we went to um, zoos and things like that, I couldn't wait to go to the reptile cages so I could see these snakes in particular. They are one of only two species. This is um, Aspidites ramsii. Um, the only other species in that family or in the, in the family genus, I'm, I'm never gonna get confused, but Aspidites melanocephalus. So the black-headed python and the Woma are the only two species in that group, whatever the group is. This is Aspidites Ramsey. Eye. Great yellowish face with like a little mask over his eyes. Just yep. super awesome and really friendly. All right, buddy. We're going to put you back. Try not to drag my arm again across that cable. There we go. And $10 Australian from PhD Tony. Thank you for the stream. Four ninety nine from Clayton Smith is Satanism a subset of humanism? You might get different answers on this. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't say that Satanism is a subset, but they're, they're practically the same thing. I mean, they they, they are they are both humanist. I think they, no, Satanism doesn't say that it's humanist. I say that that Satanism is humanism dressed for a black metal concert. Yeah, and I or would in not goth drag if you prefer. I, I would agree. I don't think Satanism is rightly classified as a subset of humanism, but there are certainly things about a number of different Satanist organizations and, and principles that I would say are consistent with humanism. I've agreed with the bulk of Satan, Satanist positions for most of my adult life. Um, and I don't really find a lot of fault. There is a lot of overlap, but if it was, if it's humanism, like cosplaying, I'm not a fan of cosplay and I have a big problem. I like the fact that by calling it Satanism, you're, you're like pissing off Christians, um, and making them, you know, maybe scaring them by thinking this there's, it, I think it's undeniable that nothing is going to be a better pathway to church state separation than Satanism. Because when they want to have their prayer and their after school clubs and all this stuff, 
and the law would require them to also allow Satanist groups to do that, all of a sudden, equality becomes way more important, and let's just shut it down. I don't identify as a Satanist, despite agreeing with him on a number of things, because I just find the label and the cosplay stuff uh, does not fit me. Yeah, I, I get that, except I'd that I dress this way anyway. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'll party with, you know, if you said, hey, would you rather party with a group of Satanists or a group of humanists? I'd rather party with a group of Satanists uh, just because the party is going to be better. $5 from Candace Planet. Y'all are the greatest. Thank you, Snake Duel Time. Awesome possum. Thank you, Candace. <laughs> 499 from Sarah Christine. Hi, Matt. Snakes, you say? Hmm. Yes. Snakes, lots of them. We have, I think, seven species right now that we, um, well, I would say we're breeding. Not all of our groups are ready to breed. We have uh, corn snakes, some of which have already bred. Um, we have the Womas, which have not bred, although we're hoping that the girl is going to be of the right size this year so we'd like to be able to produce womas in 2024 um i just need to get her weighed and because she's so prone to biting it's very difficult to get her weighed i think i think she's a little over 1200 right now but um so yes we have corn snakes we have womas we have a lot of ball pythons i bet we produced 60 some odd baby ball pythons already this year or and uh there's 11 17 eggs still down in the incubator we also have western hognose snakes texas rat snakes um dry marking you have basically black rats. tail I have, a, I have a scaleless texas rat snake oh that's right we have a scaleless texas rat we have a scaleless corn we have a couple other extra, extra corns we have african house snakes um and I'm sure I'm forgetting something, but if that's seven, then that's that's what we got. Yeah, we're up to like 75 as of tomorrow morning. We're, we're picking up another bull snake. So Snakes, most of ours are colubrids. My, most of ours are colubrids. My wife has found a, has a fondness for boas all at once, but we, we also have a dozen ball pythons. And so uh, anyway, $5 from the Raven 200. And it came to pass that I, Raven, did spake unto thee. Oh, wait, wrong show. <laughs> um, Jimmy, go take a fire style burning ash by Asuma Saratobi. I have no idea. I'm too old to know video games. 999 from Web Fiji. My mom is being drawn deeper into the Hare Krishna movement and gradually being detached from us. That is affecting me and my kids. How do I handle this? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I I haven't had to interact with Hare Krishnas at that particular uh, level. I think that what I would say is... Um, you might want to talk to an expert on Hare Krishnas. You might want to talk to an expert on cults and cult deprogramming um, because the type of advice that I'm going to give is going to be about how to argue and how to let your mom know, hey, I just love you. I'm not trying to take away your religion or anything else. I just worry about this because it doesn't make sense to me and you're, you're making changes and all this other stuff. Um, th that's the sort of thing I'd recommend. And actually, whereas normally I'd recommend contacting recoveringfromreligion.org, I don't even know if recoveringfromreligion.org has any experts on um, the Christian movement. I don't know. Are, yeah, the, are only, you, got? the only the only big contradiction that I found in in the Krishna is that uh, the, the the message about why do you have to be vegetarian? Well, because you can't eat you know, cattle or whatever, because they might be the reincarnated or ancestors, you know, uh, former family members and that sort of thing. But at the same time, he was explaining to King Arjuna that you, Arjuna was saying at the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita that he wasn't going to go to war against his, his family and friends, his kinsmen. He's just going to lay down his arms and let them kill him rather than raise a weapon. And Krishna says, but it is your caste. You're in the warrior caste. You don't have a choice. You have to 
go kill all these people that are your family and friends. But you don't, don't worry about it because you're not killing their souls. You're just killing their bodies. Well, if that's the case, then why can't I eat cattle? Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I don't know what else to tell you right now, Web Fiji, but uh, I, I feel for you. And, and by the way, call in or email sometime. Um, let me know what the resolution is. Did you find a way to do this or, or, you know, can you be more specific about the difficulty? Because it's, um, it, it, it's an issue that I, I, I haven't had to deal with. And yet I can tell you that I have family members who are, while they're not necessarily in the hard Christian movement, have some incredibly ridiculous beliefs that I think are doing harm to them and others. And all I can do is let them know that I disagree, but I still love them. And I wish that they listen to reason to, to quote my, my Brian Steaks, my theme song. So, uh, there was another chat up there. Okay. So $50 Californian Canadian from eminence 18. I would prefer long and not that painful way, to, long and not that painful way to go. I like pretty snakes, but where I'm from, we just have garter snakes. I like them because as a kid, I always used to move them from my bike path and felt so cool in my hand. Yeah. I'm going to do this. <sighs> you stop <That> was me. <laughs> I called you just to make that sound. Uh, four ninety nine from Coffee Mom. Does snakes need to know what happens to their eggs, or do they not seem to notice? Oh, they do notice. Uh, well, actually, so I appreciate the question. We'll we'll talk more about stuff, but we can't talk about snakes as if they're a a, um, a monolithic group. Because first of all, not all snakes lay eggs. Uh, for example, pythons do, boas don't. Um, corn snakes do, anacondas don't, but anacondas are technically boas. Um, for our snakes that lay eggs. Um, they would sit on them and incubate them, but w they're better in an incubator. And so we take them away. We have yet to be bitten by any of the moms, but they do put up a little hissy fit. And what we do is we take, um, the mom off of the eggs. And what we've done for most of these, like we did the other day is I take the eggs and put them into our, um, our tubs that we put into the incubator. And they'll incubate for 54, ball python eggs will incubate for 54 days at 89 and a half degrees. And then Arden will take the mom into the other room and give her a thorough washing down. Um, and what that does is it removes the smell of the eggs from them. And we put them in an, an entirely new clean enclosure so that they're not still sitting there smelling the eggs because they will act and continue to to coil up and act as if they have eggs but if you if you wash them off basically that shifts them to the next phase so that they will then go back on food because they, they go off food for many many months as they're uh when they, they eat a lot more when they're building follicles but when they're turning those follicles into eggs and we have an ultrasound we use to detect all this and know how far along they are in the process um they go off food for months while they're building those eggs and you want to get them back on food at a, at a, at a good pace. So they do notice. Thanks coffee mom. And that is the finale of all the super chats, dude. We did a whole show. Yeah. I only I, had to pull I, out. Still wish we, <laughs> I wish we could get, Seriously, I mean, I mean, all the believers that might watch this and be in, be, maybe be in the chat. Do you, do you listen to the people that get on the line with us and realize, wow, that guy's really doing bad. I, I could have done so much better. Next time I'm on, can you do that? Can you, can you call in and do so much better? Yeah, it's, you know, but I've, I've been hosting call-in shows where we've been asking for theists to call in for almost 20 years. Um, this this next year will be well it's it's 19 years next month i think is is exactly how long i've been actively calling into or participating with with call-in shows 
And there are some good calls. They are rare. And what happens quite frequently is people like, and, and they come after me on Twitter and they'll be like, oh, you only take, you know, the worst believers or the dumbest people or the people who have no credibility or they're not real theologians or they don't do this. And I'm like, okay, you say that. Why aren't you calling? Well, I'm not going to call if you're in control of the microphone. Okay. You do realize that every single person that is called in and argued in good faith who didn't run up against the, Hey, we're at the end of the show. Like somebody did the other day. Um, they, those are the people that get the most time and have the most, you know, conversations. Anybody who's absolutely awful, who we have a long call with, it's either because myself or somebody else is incredibly optimistic about getting them to say the thing that they need to say. I was like, Oh, you're almost there. You're almost there. You're almost there. Or there aren't other theistic callers holding. And so we're going to take the caller that we got today. I was really surprised. I mean, it's skeptic talk. I'm not normally here. We got quite a few, like all the theistic callers were more about the philosophical side than they were hard evidence in creationism. And I think it's probably because they're all afraid of iron. They're also afraid of I forest. remember when I, <laughs> I remember when I did a show with you when we were in a live TV studio and my daughter was there, she was in the audience and I wanted to show off cause my daughter's there to, you know, see what I do. And every call we got that day was, was basically people say, well, I just wanted to call and say, you, you to think what you're doing is really great and you're really great. So thank yeah. you. Like, yeah, that's, that's, that's great. Thank you. But that makes lousy TV. And yeah. it was in the last awesome. two minutes, it was the last two minutes of the show. We got somebody that sounded like when she had an actual argument, she's a theist. This is something we could discuss. And it sounded like she was doing it in good faith. So we can actually have a prolonged discussion about this and maybe actually get somewhere. But unfortunately it was the last we, two minutes. <laughs> we got two more super chats. And, uh, so we'll knock both these out. Nine, nine, nine from Jeffrey Waldo just says, thanks. Thank you, Jeffrey. We greatly appreciate that. And you can take this last one and then we'll wrap it up. Okay, five dollars from Dusty B. Uh, recovering from religion, volunteer views and opinions are my own. I don't see any specific resources for Hare Krishna, but definitely reach out to RFR. We can still help. That's outstanding. Yeah. I just saw one more come in, although uh, it's from Cookies. So, okay. burning question: Did you research Jared Leto? No, I, I have not because I don't know what to look for. Um, and also because I, I'm convinced that in much the same way that I, I left that debate with an individual who I think might have needed some help, I'm pretty sure the caller was either a troll or needed some help. And so if I knew what to look for from Jared Leto, I might, but I don't. Okay. Take us home. See, there you go. Thanks to everybody who tuned in. Thanks to the callers. Thanks to RNN and the Snack. Uh, thanks to Amargan for producing. Thanks to our Patreon producers that you see on the list right there. Uh, don't forget to tune in. And don't forget to subscribe. Uh, don't forget to go to Call the Line or patreon.com slash Call the Line because we have a line on coming up next April. Go watch all the rest of the shows. Tell them how much you love them.